Straight ahead on Eyewitness News Live at 6, a coroner's jury will decide who's responsible for the death of a French man in the Clark County Detention Center. We'll have a live report on the coroner's inquest. And the family and friends of a 12-year-old killed in a crosswalk mourn his loss and look for ways to prevent another tragedy. High school students, listen up. It could be tougher to get admitted to UNLV if some university officials have their way. I'm Tom Jones. I'll explain coming up in a live report. And ice fishing in southern Nevada? <laughs> yep, it's a big-time sport, as you'll see in my special Discover Nevada. You're watching Eyewitness News at 6 with Gary Waddell, Paula Francis, and Kevin Janison. He wanted me to call uh, the then President Clinton, uh, Vice President Al Gore. He wanted me to call uh, George Bush for him. He wanted me to call his father that he said lived in the Ivory Coast. School police tell the jury about bizarre behavior in the hours before French citizen Philippe Le Man died as the coroner's inquest starts into Le Man's controversial death. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Le Man died last month while being held in the Clark County Detention Center. Le Man's family says he was murdered at the jail. The coroner did find Le Mans died of asphyxiation, but he did not find what caused Le Mans to suffocate. The death has triggered a worldwide controversy. Eyewitness News is live. Eric Levine is at the courthouse with the latest. Eric. Paula, good evening. It's been a long day. Earlier this morning, we heard about Mr. Lemans' mental health, which did not sound very good. But the real key to this case will hinge on what happened at 6.20 that night in the Clark County Detention Center. Whether or not those Metro Corrections officers' behavior was justified, excusable, or criminal in nature. The question is this. Was it justifiable force or an abuse of power? that caused Philippe Lemaine's death at the hands of Metro Correctional Officers. Lemaine died from asphyxiation in jail January 4th. Corrections Officer G. Rumbaugh told the jury he was only trying to subdue Lemaine, who was struggling and unwilling to cooperate. I'm trying to get a good angle so I can spray him in the face, hopefully to, to bring an end to the struggle so we can all step out of there and secure the door. Witnesses also testified Lemaine was angry, paranoid, and screaming the day he died. Eric Lowry was in jail and saw Lemen die. He originally told detectives he didn't see much, but he came to us to say he's changed his story and believes Lemen's death never should have happened. Got him down naked, and they they backed him into the cell backwards, and they they didn't proceed to give him any commands to tell him, you know, you know, basically not to resist. But he was he was screaming a couple of weird comments and stuff, but nothing to to invoke this. Meanwhile, more corrections officers are expected to take the stand in their defense, while friends, family, and members of the French consulate are pushing for a separate FBI investigation. And Gary, Paula, no word yet as to whether or not the FBI plans to step in. We do know that the family of Le Mans wants to file a civil suit regardless of what happens here. Meanwhile, testimony continues tonight and possibly tomorrow until all those corrections officers testify and three more witnesses, and then we'll receive the jury's decision. Eric Levine, Eyewitness News, live. Thank you, Eric. Another Las Vegas area teacher is in trouble for alleged sexual relations with a student. 38-year-old James Gabriel was arrested early this morning in Escondido, California, which is near San Diego. A motel security guard called police after discovering two people in the parking lot engaged in a sex act. Police arrested Gabriel and placed the 16-year-old girl in protective custody. Gabriel is a social studies teacher at Western High School. The girl is identified as one of his students. It was a sad day for students at Smith Middle School today. They were mourning the loss of 12-year-old Stephen Allshouse, who was hit and killed by a truck yesterday. Cindy Caesar has the story. The French horn that Stephen Allshouse played for his school band was smashed when he was fatally hit on Thursday. It was a physical reminder that the seventh grader was involved with school activities. He will be missed by his Smith Middle School classmates. They were crying. Mm. He died. He was young to die. He had to finish his life. Allshouse was killed when a truck driver turned as the boy was clear to cross in the crosswalk. The driver says he thought that the boy was waiting for him to turn. No charges have been filed against the driver pending further investigation. 
scholarship fund has been set up by Smith Middle School. If you'd like more information, you can call 799-7080. Grief counselors were at the school today to help the students through this very tragic time. Cindy Caesar, Eyewitness News, live. Thank you, Cindy. The trial of accused murderer Margaret Rudin starts on Monday, but today Rudin and her attorneys traveled to Phoenix. The defendant, her attorneys, the prosecution, and Judge Bonaventure went to Phoenix to interview one of Ron Rudin's ex-wives. Margaret Rudin is charged with killing Ron Rudin, her millionaire husband, back in 1994. Jury selection is set to start on Monday. When opening statements and testimony begins, you can watch it all live on our cable station, Las Vegas One. We will have a complete wrap-up of the trial every night on Eyewitness News at 4, 5, 6, and 11. UNLV wants to improve its reputation. One way the school hopes to do that is by raising its admission standards for incoming freshmen. Eyewitness News is live with Tom Jones. He's at the university with more on what freshmen may need to do to get in. Tom. Well, if you're a high school student and you're thinking about attending UNLV, you may need to start to bear down on your books. That's because a higher grade point average requirement is being discussed here on campus and it could keep you from being admitted. I want to go into the Army field and become either a nurse or a doctor. High school student Joy Ortega dreams of getting her college degree. I want to stay somewhere here in Las Vegas. If she attends UNLV, she may have to hit the books a little harder. That's because the university, along with UNR, is thinking about raising the minimum grade point average requirement for incoming freshmen. Right now, a 2.5 GPA or a C plus gets you in. University officials are discussing raising the requirement to 2.75 within four years, then to 3.0 in eight years. You increase the quality of your student body overall. UNLV spokesman Tom Flack says raising the GPA requirement would bring better students to the university and increase the school's reputation. Flagg admits some students would be turned away, but not completely. While it would make some students ineligible, those at the very lowest level, uh, it doesn't shut the door on them to the university system in any way. Meaning ineligible students can go to Henderson State College once it's up and running or the community college to get their grades up. I have some mixed feelings about that. High school counselor Diane Abikaram has seen some students with high grade point averages in high school who failed in college. So I don't believe grade point average is always the indicator that a student will be successful in college. If the GPA goes higher, then yeah, I'll work harder to succeed. Now raising the minimum GPA is only an idea right now, but if the discussion gets serious, the Board of Regents and the University Chancellor would have to approve the proposal. Tom Jones, Eyewitness News, live. Thanks, Tom. A development in downtown Henderson will be delayed. Groundbreaking for the Fountain Plaza was supposed to take place in March, but the developers didn't file the final design plan on time. The 159,000 square foot office and retail space is planned for the corner of Water Street and Basic Road. You can see the area in this live picture from Chopper 8. The project's groundbreaking will be delayed until June. Soon you're going to have to start paying more for power here in Nevada. Today, the Public Utilities Commission approved a rate hike for Nevada power. The 17% increase will start on March 1st. Public Utilities Commission will hold hearings after that increase is in place. Normally, hearings are held before the rate increase, but Nevada Power said the increase is needed now has to be approved immediately because of the rising cost of power in the West, part of the problems we have seen in California. Just a few weeks ago, a magnitude 3.4 earthquake was felt here in the valley. Today, geologists from all over the state were in Las Vegas warning us all about the potential of quakes here. Eyewitness News is live. Janine Gill joins us from Flamingo and Decatur with the story. Janine? Gary, believe it or not, here at Flamingo and Decatur, there is a fault line. Now, we're here at the top of the slope, and if you could see this slope, that is the actual fault. But there's no need to be too concerned because it's not an active fault. But geologists are keeping a close eye on Nevada, and they want the community to be aware of the potential for quakes here. Thousands of fault lines are located all over Nevada. The more notable ones are near mountains, like this one along the Tobin Range. Geologists like to look at these and look for evidence of past earthquakes. The 
but here in Las Vegas, they are less noticeable. This slope on Bonanza near Cashman Field is a fault line. So is this slope in a neighborhood near Arroyo Grande and Henderson. Some people who live nearby don't seem too concerned about the possibility of earthquakes. I guess I'm like all people. Until it actually happens to me, I'm not fully aware of it, you know. But geologists say they should be. Nevada is the third most seismically active state in the country. Historically, scientists say about every other year, Nevada typically gets a quake with a magnitude of 5.0. But there is a potential for larger quakes. The sizes of earthquakes that uh, might occur around Las Vegas would uh, approach magnitude 7.5 on some of the largest ones. Now, geologists say that northern Nevada is more prone to seismic activity. However, there's still a lot they don't know about southern Nevada. They say, scientists say that it's just too difficult to predict, but they are studying if and when an earthquake will happen, and if one does hit, how big it will be. Janine Gill, Eyewitness News, live. Very interesting. Thank you, Janine. Only seven weeks or so until April 16th when taxes are due this year, so the IRS is trying to keep taxpayers informed. Tomorrow, the Las Vegas IRS office will host an Earned Income Tax Credit Awareness Day. The agency will focus on those taxpayers who can get the special credit. It both reduces the tax owed and gives refunds. If you'd like more information on the Earned Income Tax Credit, bring your question to the IRS office on West Oakey Boulevard between 8.30 a.m. and 12.30 p.m. tomorrow, or you can call their toll-free number, 1-800-829-1040. 1040, huh? <laughs> Remember that? Well, it's a popular winter pastime in the Northeast, but ice fishing in southern Nevada? Well, don't be surprised. You can find out where people are cutting through the ice for fish in tonight's Discover Nevada. Plus, it may not restore sight, but it does stop the pain. See a new technique to end eye pain in medical breakthroughs. You know, when I was looking at it, that is definitely something that would be really hard for me. And then there were two. Find out the last survivors in tonight's Las Vegas Survivor. And we'll show you how you can help pick the final winner. But first, Kevin Jennison joins us with the weekend forecast. Kevin. Paul and Gary, I don't think we're going to make it through this weekend unscathed. More weather on its way towards southern Nevada. Well, you may like it, too. We'll give you the complete forecast details and all your neighborhood weather heading into the weekend in just a couple of minutes. You're watching Eyewitness News with Paula Francis and Gary Waddell. This portion of Eyewitness News is brought to you by General Motors. When you think of wintertime fun in southern Nevada, images of strolling on a golf course or maybe even taking a dip in a heated pool may come to mind. But can you imagine going ice fishing in the desert? I'll show you where in tonight's Discover Nevada. Ay, ay, ay. Whew. It's not the usual way Las Vegans dress during winter. All right, here we go. But then Greg Hedrick and J.C. Coleman may be more adventurous than most. It's supposed to be four inches to support 200 pounds, and uh, right now we're running eight inches, so we Thank have you. plenty of room. Cutting your hole can be a workout. But once you break through, it's easy to get hooked. We just throw the lures in there, and normally we're pulling the fish out within a couple of minutes. The first bite comes fast. Oh, there he is. Then another. Beautiful little rainbow. And another. There he is. There the big boy. Welcome to ice fishing season in Spring Valley State Park. Located 175 miles northeast of Las Vegas, near the town of Pioche, Spring Valley is the home of the Eagle Valley Reservoir, a 65-acre man-made lake. Nighttime temperatures can plunge as much as uh, 26 to 30 below zero and, and hang that way for several days and, and results in ice on the lake anywhere from 3 to 18 inches thick. The ice fishing season here at Spring Valley State Park depends on the weather. Generally, by mid-December, you can walk on the ice. You can usually fish here till early March. Learning to trust the thickness of the ice comes with experience. When you first come out here in December, and it's cracking and moving and popping and, and uh, the water sloshing out of the hole and the crack will come right down between your legs then you're a little nervous but after a while you just settle in and and uh, you can almost go to sleep out here on sunny days temperatures may hit the high 40s this is an absolutely splendid place the mountains are beautiful the, it, 
how, how many people get to go ice fishing in the desert? Las Vegas Steve Thiel and his friends have come here every February for the last 25 years. We get up when the sun comes up. We stay out here in the lake until the sun goes down. It's, it's, it's a good time. My wife refers to it as male bonding. This is his son's first time on the outing. You know, since I was born, they've been going ice fishing. Now I said, hey, Dad, can I go ice fishing? No. Nope. When you're 21. Fish pulled from the lake average 8 to 12 inches, but there are exceptions. Oh, hey, yeah, I got a big brown. That's a nice fish there. That's the biggest one I've, I've caught up here. The limit is five, but these pros throw back whatever they catch. Okay, big boy, go back. Because it's not the fish that lures them here, but the fishing. I, I just love coming up here. I'd come up here every weekend if I could. It's a beautiful day. Most of them catch and release up there. More than 95% of the Spring Valley State Park's visitors are from Las Vegas. During the winter, it's best to call ahead to check on weather conditions. To get there, take I-15 north to Highway 93, head north through Caliente to State Route 322, and then follow the signs to Spring Valley State Park. It's about a three-hour drive from Las Vegas. I could see how that would be very relaxing, but I'd like to eat the fish, too. Uh, uh, I mean, you can keep them, too, and a lot of people do. The guys we were with, were they'd pinch the barb shut yeah. and then just, you know, catch and release. Most of them, a lot of them would come off before they'd get them out of the water, yeah. so they didn't hurt anything, and they put them back for next year. Nice story. No yeah. Loch Ness monsters or anything. Didn't catch one. I don't know. It may still be there, <laughs> Kevin. You never know. Up there, you never certainly. know. They get this big. We should mention, too, that uh, we're going to have a new neighborhood weather station in Pioch oh, in the next few months, so people won't only have to call up. They could check it out hey, on our air neat. or on the Internet site, Very too. Nice. Yeah, that's coming up. We hope to have that one up there by spring or uh, maybe early summer, the way things are shaping up. Snowman. Yeah, well, speaking of snow, I'm glad you brought that up, Gary. We've got a little bit of snow to show you just outside of San Diego. Pretty wild to see these pictures so low elevation-wise. Just once you get into the foothills outside of San Diego, the snow was falling. Another cold system pouring down from the north. This one producing quite a bit of precipitation and just a few clouds for us, though here in the Las Vegas Valley. Let's go with real-time neighborhood weather. We will begin on the Strip, our neighborhood weather station there at Desert Passage. 52 degrees, but only 17%. Very dry air mass. Near Eastern and the St. Rose Parkway, south end of town, also 52 degrees. It's 53 up in the northwest near Buffalo and Cheyenne, and 49 for the Prumpsters right now with a little higher humidity, not too much. 55 near Eastern and Charleston, also a lot of 55s on the east side of town. 50 near Jones and Tropicana, and 51 in Green Valley. Outside the valley, 24 on the mountain, 49 in Boulder City, and the Moapa Valley, Overton, and Lyon Middle School coming in at 52 degrees. A little bit of wind today, but not nearly as strong as yesterday. The peak gust in town was 32 miles per hour, although way up here in the far northwest, there was a gust of 29. Outside the valley, the strongest gust was in Searchlight, that one to 33 miles per hour. 31 for a high on the mountain, 61 in Boulder City, Laughlin all the way up to 73. And on the east side of the valley, low to mid 60s, and you go westward across town, pretty much find the mid 50s, especially up in the northwest for high temperatures. At McCarran, the top temp today, 58, 7 degrees shy of normal. The morning low was 43, and we've got a mess through the midsection of the country. This is going to produce heavy snow in the portions of Minnesota, Wisconsin, eventually Michigan, and then there's heavy rain in parts of Missouri, across through Illinois and Indiana. Go farther down here, and there are severe thunderstorms, and even a couple of tornado watches earlier in effect for parts of Texas and Oklahoma. On the flight back home, just a few clouds here and there. There were those showers just outside of San Diego. This system sort of dived southward along the coast and now moving into Baja, California, and all we got were just a few clouds out of it. But this next one might not be that lenient on us. Here's the area of low pressure that is in the developing stages, so it's still sort of difficult to get a good handle on it. But the low is expected to work its way into Southern California and Southern Nevada and bring with it a lot of moisture it has available out here. So we have a pretty good chance for rain if everything comes together as expected late on Sunday. Here's how your forecast stacks up for the remainder of your Friday night, though. The skies will continue to clear. Just a couple of clouds remaining out there. Still breezy at times, but those two will die down late. 39 for the low temperature. Tomorrow we'll start out with plenty of sunshine early, but the clouds will start rolling in the afternoon, and there will be a little bit of a breeze. 59 the expected high. Up on the mountain, look for a high of 39, which, by the way, is our low here in the valley. The morning low, 12, and your seven-day extended forecast. Chances for rain Sunday and Monday, possibly lingering into Tuesday before we finally get serious about this weather and get some warmer stuff, restore some order, get some warmer stuff in here by the <laughs> end of next week. Back out of the bus earlier today, we'd like to say hello to some very fine students, fourth, fifth, 
A couple of sixth and even a whole class of first graders joining us out at the Mary Hill School in Summerlin. Uh, a very sharp group, too, as far as uh, their weather knowledge is concerned. So I want to thank them for their hospitality. Always enjoy the kids who stick their tongues out for the camera. I know at this point their parents are so proud. <laughs> but I want to say hello again and thank them for the good time we had out there earlier this afternoon. Thank you, Kevin. Sure. Tonight in Medical Breakthroughs, a new procedure makes eye replacements easier and less painful. When an eye is removed, an implant is used to maintain the natural shape and support for the eye socket. The implant is normally held in place with donor material, but it runs the risk of rejection and can be painful. Now there's a better way. Anything else today? Ten years ago, a detached retina caused Tony Redford to lose the sight in his right eye. I just thought, well, maybe it's just an infection in my eye. So I worked for two days. Wrong, bad decision. Six operations and several years later, Tony was still in tremendous pain. I was experiencing the burning sensation, more like someone pouring alcohol in an open cut. Tony's bad eye was removed along with an ear muscle. It's a muscle Surgeon Thomas Noggle says we can live without. But in humans, we only need it for those of us who can wiggle our ears. The muscle replaces donor material that normally would hold the implant in place. That means there's less infection, generally speaking. There's less rejection. And also, there's less risk of uh, infectious disease transmission, such as HIV or hepatitis. But it looks pretty good. Let me see you move it to the right. The muscle also allows the new acrylic eyepiece to move in sync with the other eye. The excruciating pain Tony had is now gone. Overall, I think it looks quite good here. Most of all, he says he's happy to be back on the job pain-free. Dr. Noggle says the procedure is also effective in treating eye problems caused by Graves' disease and Bell's palsy. If you'd like more information about this, send us a self-addressed stamped envelope and write eye implants on the outside. You can also, of course, get information on our website, and that's Medical Breakthroughs. All right. Very interesting, Paula. Chris Matthews is here with our financial report from UNLV. <laughs> that's right. They need some money over there, as normally. UNLV Athletic Department is operating the red. They need some money at UNLV. What kind of effect will that have on bringing this man to Las Vegas? We've got the final answer coming up next in sports. For the first time since the mid-90s, UNLV's athletic department is operating in the red. Assistant Athletic Director Jerry Koloski says UNLV is about three to four hundred thousand dollars in the red. A memo distributed through the department indicates the main reason for the shortfall are lower than anticipated ticket sales and scholarship donations. Koloski says the shortfall won't affect recruiting and team travel, which is considered a high priority. He says the department, which operates on a budget of $14 million, needs to tighten up just a little bit, generating money through corporate sales, Koloski says, and one reason they can help raise some funds there. Now, the shortfall, will it have an effect on UNLV's ability to pay a basketball coach? Not at all, according to Koloski. The coaches... Uh, state money is pretty much fixed for that. It's money from TV, radio, and shoe contracts that could boost the salary into the million-dollar range. And, of course, it's that kind of money that will bring this man to Las Vegas. Whether it's official or not, it's pretty much a matter of semantics now. They want him. He wants UNLV, perhaps the only stumbling block. And we've been told it isn't one. His wife is coming out next week to give her a stamp of approval. Even the former running Rebel coach is becoming a believer. Bill Baino telling contacts that things are working in favor of Rick Pitino being named head coach at UNLV. As for Rick Pitino's wife visiting Las Vegas, another husband-wife team did the same thing a few years ago. John Robinson and his wife Linda scouted Las Vegas, and the coach feels Patino's wife will like what she sees. Thanks, well, she'll like it, and, and I think she'll get uh, uh, a really good reception. And, and as all of us that live here know, that there are great schools here. I think they have small children. And they have, there are great schools, great communities, uh, great restaurants. <laughs> now you're getting into my hair. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's a great place. And, you know, you just you have to come see it and discover it. And, and we know that he's a great coach, and we know that there's a, just a sleep giant here in, in basketball and I believe in football. Boy, what a great ambassador for the he city, is. John Robinson. Yeah, we, huh? were, we were trying to keep it a secret, too. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Chris. Chris. See, you See you in a few minutes. There's more news straight ahead. Police are searching for answers in the death of a man at the Tropicana Hotel. We'll show you what happened. 
And we'll show you how the internet is being used in Valley classrooms and how it helps students. I thought him, as soon as they t you told us what we had to do, I was like, oh, this is really going to be a challenge. Oh, God. And it's the final challenge, and it's one of endurance. See the final two survivors, and we'll show you how then you can help decide the ultimate winner. Eyewitness News at 6.30 starts now. You're watching Eyewitness News at 6.30 with Gary Waddell, Paula Francis, Evan Jennison, and Dave McCann. Thanks for staying with us. The inquest into the death of a French man at the Clark County Detention Center starts tonight's top stories. A coroner's inquest got underway today in the case of a Frenchman who died at the Clark County Jail. The Metro officers who arrested Philippe Lemaine told the judge and jury that Lemaine was acting and yelling strangely outside a valley school in the hours before his death. The dump truck driver who hit and killed a 12-year-old Las Vegas boy has not been charged in the accident. The boy, Stephen Allshouse, was crossing Eastern at Cyril's yesterday when he was hit by the truck. Experts are reminding Las Vegans that our city sits on dozens of fault lines that have the potential for causing earthquakes. At a meeting today, geologists reminded people that Nevada has the third highest seismic activity of all the states. Security at the Tropicana Hotel discovered a body in one of the hotel's rooms early today. The body of a 45-year-old Minnesota tourist was discovered about 1230. The man was last seen alive with an alleged prostitute at one of the Tropicana's bars late Wednesday evening. Police believe the man's death could be drug-related. Autopsy results are pending. Police are investigating two men suspected in a violent crime spree. The crime spree reached a climax yesterday when a limousine driver was shot in the back with a shotgun. The men are suspected in the shooting and are believed to be responsible for a number of armed robberies, burglaries, and drug deals. Metro Police arrested one suspect, Aaron Vasquez, yesterday afternoon. Another suspect, Brian Cohen, was taken into custody last night. The limo driver was treated and released from UMC. Two more possible cases of childhood leukemia have surfaced in Fallon, Nevada. That's in addition to 11 cases already reported. These latest cases are not confirmed yet, but they have state lawmakers calling for an emergency $1 million appropriation to speed up the search for a cause. The only link between the cases so far is that all the victims live in Fallon. Las Vegas is going country this weekend, and it's all for a good cause. Radio station KWNR 95.5 is hosting the ninth annual Country Cares Radiothon at the Galleria. The event raises money for research and treatment for children with cancer and other catastrophic diseases. All the money goes to St. Jude Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, where children from Las Vegas and all over the world are treated for free. To put it real simply, it renews your faith in man and how much they care about people they don't even know and that they will, would be willing to give $20 a month to help save your child's life. You can call in a donation at the number on the screen or stop at the Galleria for donations of $50 or more. You can receive autographed memorabilia from your favorite country star. In tonight's 8 Online, can you imagine sending out 5 million emails? Well, teachers and students in the Clark County School District celebrated that milestone this week. Interact, an online learning tool, helps to bring the Internet into the classroom. Teachers use it to exchange lessons and ideas. Students say sometimes this is the only chance they have to use the computer. We learn about presidents and um, lots of other stuff that we study in school. Like what? Um, math, science, bats. <laughs> For teachers, the five millionth email also provided an opportunity to talk about math and the number five million. Most of us here in Southern Nevada have visited Hoover Dam, but the next time you go to the dam, try using the self-guided tour offered on the dam's website. The self-guided tour includes information about the architecture of the monuments on top of the dam and about how the dam was built and just how it works. <laughs> Reading means the world to one local woman. In tonight's Portraits of Pride, see how she shares her gift of literacy with others.
A woman here in Southern Nevada is trying to stamp out illiteracy in the African American community. That woman is Patricia Thomas, and she is our Portrait of Pride for Black History Month tonight. Polly Gonzalez has her story. Courage is the most important of all virtues because without it, we can't practice any other virtue with consistency. A quote by Maya Angelou, read by Patricia Thomas, a woman who lives by the word and teaches it too. Stay, stay, great, it's hard to stay, believe stay. adults only now learning to read. A. The average person out there goes to the library to pick up a book, but these people come to pick up a new word or two. It's really, it's a challenge for them and it's a challenge for me also. And those are the things that, you know, we take for granted. But these people are here, they're wanting to learn, they're eager to learn, and as long as I can help, uh, I'm here. Patricia Thomas helps these people through the CALL program, Computer Assisted Literacy in Libraries. It's a county program where people, regardless of age, learn to read. And Thomas says for some, the reasons are simple. I know I had one student that said the only thing that she wanted to do is be able to really read her Bible. And that just really touched, you know, my heart. It really did. Thomas understands that feeling. She says coming from a family of 12 brothers and sisters, her parents always made her feel blessed. That may be why she's always wanted to help people. Right now, she's pursuing a degree in social work. She hopes to one day work full time with teenagers, but she says she'll always be a volunteer. You know, you share things with other people, let them know, you know, life isn't all that bad. You know, we've all, we all go through and just sharing these things kind of gives them that uplift also. And let them know, you know, just, and tell them, trust in the Lord and it will definitely be all right. Channel 8 salutes Patricia Thomas as a portrait of pride for Black History Month. Very nice. If you'd like to help the call program, just contact any library. We could see some rainy weather this weekend. Kevin will be here with a forecast coming up. Which two contestants will be left standing when all the dust settles? Find out in the final episode of Las Vegas Survivors, coming up. A chilly night up on the mountain. It's already down to 23 degrees. The breeze has backed off after gusting to 16 miles per hour. The high temperature on the mountain, only 31. Back in town, we'll go and actually farther south, we'll head down to Searchlight where it's 43 degrees right now and 31% humidity. Near Eastern and Charleston, right in the middle of the city, it's 55 degrees. And up in Mesquite, the mosquitoes feeling 55 degree air with a light breeze at 4 miles per hour. Other temperatures in neighborhoods across the valley, it's 52 in North Las Vegas, 50 near Jones and Tropicana, 48 in Pahrump, 47 in Indian Springs, and down in Laughlin at Bennett Elementary, it is 56 degrees. Let me show you what's happening around the rest of the country right now. This is going to be the area to watch tonight and tomorrow. Big time snow moving into Minnesota and Wisconsin. It is going to pile up with this chilly air mass. It is rain and some heavy thunderstorms, especially as you get into Texas. Some of these storms have reached severe limits. As far as we're concerned, we've got this system basically in the organizational stages right now. It'll come together, slide on in for Sunday. We could see some rain on Sunday, and if not Sunday, there's a better chance on Monday as that thing gets going. Tonight, skies will continue to clear 39 degrees for the low temperature. Tomorrow, plenty of morning sunshine, followed by some clouds in the afternoon and an afternoon breeze out of the southwest. Look for a high tomorrow of 59. If you're heading up to the mountain, the high temperature there only 39. The morning low will be 12. And a look ahead at your seven-day extended forecast. We are looking for a good chance for rain late Sunday and Monday, possibly lingering into Tuesday. And then that's all we can handle. Then we'll be back to sunshine and warmer weather as we get toward the end of next week. Back with the final challenge in Las Vegas Survivors <laughs> coming up in a couple of minutes. All right, Kevin. Chris Matthews is here now with all the sports. Some disturbing news today about what may have happened to Dale Earnhardt. Oh. Exactly. That's what's going on now. Following the weekend death of stock car driver Dale Earnhardt, an investigation into the hows and whys are now public. We'll share those conclusions. Also, the running rebels are on the road for some players. This is their first trip to San Diego. Sports is next here on Channel 8. Five days following the death of legendary stock car driver Dale Earnhardt, racing officials tell us what happened. NASCAR says Dale Earnhardt's seat belt broke. They say they've never seen anything like it, and they're trying to learn when, where, and how it broke. A doctor who treated Earnhardt says he would have had a much better chance of surviving Sunday's crash if that belt had held. 
Well, the running rebels are in San Diego this weekend where it's been raining and even some hail. And they can certainly calm the storm with a win over the Aztecs. For some of the guys on this team, it'll be their first trip to America's most livable city. Um, I've never been there, but uh, I just want to win this game, and that's all I want to do. It's you know, a new experience for me. I've never been to San Diego and go up there and you know, have fun and play hard and try to win. I want these seniors to, to really finish a year with a great degree of dignity and self-respect and knowing they gave it their all and, and uh, you know that they've accomplished the, uh, the, the two-year JUCO players, knowing that they accomplished a great deal in the two years they were here and the four-year players to understand that they got an awful lot done in the four years they were here. The last time UNLV and the Aztecs played, it was here at the Thomas and Mack, and the Rebels snuck away with an overtime win. It won't be too many more days, and UNLV's football team will be back on the field. They've been picked in some publications a top 25 team. Spring football is only three weeks away. But what about the spring and next fall? It kind of depends on what they've achieved this winter. Oh, I don't think there's any question. I think that um, leadership, which that's where, which where all of that really has an, an effect, started last year with our seniors um, who have now gone. But I think now our players say, oh, if I'm going to win, I've got to change from year to year. I've got to get you know, stronger, faster, smarter, uh, more determined. So I think that's getting to be a, an ethic of our team, and that's what winning teams do. Spring ball officially begins March 20th, runs through April 12th with the annual Meet the Team scrimmage on April 7th. Up north, it's Gorman going for another title. The boys' basketball team is playing for a title tonight. Gorman plays Western for the state crown. It'll be the fourth meeting between the two schools this season. The Gales have beaten the Warriors in each of the first three. The final time for the Sunset Regional title close game, 60 to 56 was the final. Finally, golfers enjoying themselves, at least some of them, at the Nissan Open at Pacific Palisades, California. They play at the Riviera Country Club. Davis Love the third with his second shot. Great approach on 13. He's chasing Sergio Garcia and Tom Shear. This settles in close enough for the short bird. Love near the top of the leaderboard. Tiger Woods proving that last year was a remarkable year. Woods never made a putt longer than four feet and shot a 71. Third round tomorrow right here on Channel 8. He's human. Yeah, I think. It's amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. You bet. Will it be Roger, Christopher, or Chrissy? Just ahead, find out which survivors will make it to the final two. We'll see how you can help decide the ultimate winner as well. Stay with us for Las Vegas Survivor. Here we are. Tonight's the final installment. We find out the final two survivors. Here's Kevin. And you guys are voting for one of the two. <laughs> Come on. Uh, well, let's watch. No. Right. Well, you were having a conversation too. earlier on who you We're objective. About. Okay, yeah. You, that's the public presence being spoken there. Tonight will be the final challenge, and the winner of Las Vegas Survivors wins immunity from being voted out. So... They are not only guaranteed a spot in the final two, that is the winner of tonight's challenge, but that person will also decide who will join him or her. Because there are only three left, the two that don't win the challenge, their votes would cancel each other out. So, as a result, tonight's winner has even more power and a strong chance to win the Toyota RAV4 on Las Vegas Survivors. <laughs> It's come down to this, the final day. Three contestants are left, Christopher, Chrissy, and Roger. These three have remained true to their word. They have stuck by each other throughout the entire competition. We've, we've done what we said, and we're the only three that really stuck together. And um, it's gonna be hard, and I think basically it's gonna come down to who gets immunity between if, you know, if it does come down to us three. Like I said, if Roger or Christy win, I'll be, you know, a lady. I don't have any problems with that at all. We're on our own. If we give our word, I mean, there hasn't been a lot of that going on. Any, you know, alliances or back things, so I'm not worried about it. Two will remain before this day is done. It all comes down to the final challenge. We have seen our survivors compete as teams. We have seen them compete as individuals, yet stay true to their teammates. But now... They are on their own, each one with one goal, to be one of the final two. Only one thing stands in their way. It stretches 12 feet into the air, where at its peak are three bottles. Around the neck of each bottle is a 10-foot piece of twine, which leads to a cinder block. It is our final challenge. It is the final stand. 
Each contestant will position themselves on top of the block facing the pole. The twine will then be placed in each contestant's mouth. The last person standing with the twine in their mouth will receive immunity and guaranteed to be one of the final two. guys you've been going for 45 minutes we're going to ask you now to put your right arm shoulder height extend it from your body with your palm up oh Chris you go ahead and have a seat I was really hurting. My arm was shaking the whole nine yards. And then I looked at him, and his arm was shaking. Christopher is the winner and has immunity. He's guaranteed to be one of the finalists. But now, Christopher will vote and decide on who will join him in the final two. Roger. <laughs> we all accepted any outcome. I mean, we all were, you know, before this, we all said, you know, whatever the outcome is, we had a great time, and it was all worth it. You know, we made good friends, and, and that's, that makes us all winners. It's been a long week. Uh, I just hope that I've uh, shown the qualities of what a true survivor is. It's just gonna come down to whoever you like the most, and either way, I'd be content if she won or if I won. I just wanna say, vote for whoever you think deserves it the most. We did a hell of a job trying to survive, and unfortunately, only two could make it, and fortunately, I'm one of them. Four days and nearly 90 hours, the final two contestants are Christopher and Chrissy. Now it is up to you to decide on whom you would like to see win Las Vegas Survivors. You at home can vote. You can do it two ways. You can access our internet site at klastv.com. You'll be able to vote on the internet site. Mm -hmm. Or we have a special telephone number hooked up. That number is 967-8888. That's 967, all eights. When you call up that number, you will be able to vote one for Christopher or two for Chrissy. We have set up a pretty impressive technological thing that's going to take one phone call per household and only one vote on the Internet per terminal. Uh -huh. So those people that want to spend all weekend voting won't have much luck. <laughs> wow. And that's it. We'll have the winners Wednesday night. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's been fun. That's yeah. Really they get to go all the way till 530 on the voting. There's the there phone is. number. See you at 11. Bye, everybody.